quick note here, most Americans ended up pronouncing his name Werner von Braun, which is not correct. Now, I can't do any justice to the actual German pronunciation, but apparently he was okay with Werner and he was okay with von, but he was not a fan of Braun. He preferred Brown because that's the German pronunciation and the literal meaning of his last name. So throughout this video, I'm gonna do my best to say von Braun. Von Braun was born into the German aristocracy in 1912, hence the von in his name, which is a sign of nobility in Germany. He spent pretty much his entire life obsessing about rockets and space travel, and he was born at a great time because Germany was going through a bit of a rocket renaissance at the time. Well, a great time except for one thing. If you do the math, he graduated as a mechanical engineer in 1932 in Germany, only seven years before it invaded Poland and kicked off World War II. Now, being an engineer who is impossibly obsessed with rockets, he found his way into the Nazi rocket development program right around the time that they were cracking down on amateur and civilian rocketry. On one hand, this was great because he could continue his work on rockets. On the other hand, he was now exclusively building weapons for arguably the most obviously evil regime in history. Now the fallback defense here is ignorance in place of malice. Obviously he knew his weapons were going to kill, but he was a naive child of the aristocracy, so he defaulted to nationalism. And in the few accounts we do have, he does seem to be genuinely disinterested in Germany's politics. But he did pick the absolute worst place and time in history to be the I don't care about politics guy. Now it is true that he joined the infamous SS. In fact, he did it twice but both times it seems to be it was more out of convenience or outside pressure, more so than any personal conviction. Now contrast this with someone on the US side like Oppenheimer, who was also developing some really terrifying weapons which would go on to shape the Cold War, and probably rightly has taken on a lot of the blame for the harm those weapons caused. But at least he was politically engaged, and whether you agree with him or not, at least he was deliberate in his decision to help the US develop a nuke before the Nazis did. And this doesn't even touch on the late war issues, where Von Braun's facility started relying on slave labor from concentration camps, uh, which he directly oversaw, so ignorance really falls apart. The crimes of the Nazi regime became obvious to even the most naive, politically disinterested person. I really need to do a full video on Von Braun one day, probably when I finish reading this book, but uh, there's a lot of history here. But anyway, back to Huntsville. In 1941, just six months before Pearl Harbor, the US announced they were going to be building a chemical weapons plant called the Huntsville Arsenal. It was going to be built on the south side of Huntsville, Alabama, a small town in Northern Alabama with a population of about 13,000. Prior to this, the US only had one chemical weapons plant and it was in Maryland, right next to the coast. This was great for transportation, but it left the facility exposed. So by building a new plant in Northern Alabama, they created a back Backup, which was much more protected, but still had decent enough shipping capabilities so it could get the weapons out. As I understand it, they also built a second plant next to the Huntsville Arsenal, which was called the Redstone Arsenal because of the reddish rocks and soil. Within two years, the arsenal was pumping out some pretty nasty chemicals. Yeah, there's a lot of murky morality in this story. The plant also produced explosives and some small solid-fueled rockets. But right around the same time, Germany was starting to produce the V2, a much more substantial and much more devastating weapon than the small rockets of the arsenal. Well, the US had technically beaten Germany to the punch with developing the first liquid-fueled rocket, Germany, under the management of von Braun, quickly met and surpassed our technology. The V2 could lob one ton of explosives 170 miles, which kind of makes it just long-range artillery. And it didn't enter production until the last year of the war. It looks like somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 were built, and they ended up killing around 9,000 people. This being World War II, where strategic bombing was the strategy, most of those deaths were probably civilian. As the war came to a close, Von Braun decided that he would surrender to the country, which was most likely to overlook his involvement in this project and let him continue his development of rocket technology. And he thought his best chance of survival was to surrender to the US. And the US had pretty much the same idea. They launched Operation Paperclip to capture Nazi scientists so that we can learn about the technologies they created and allow them to continue to develop them for us. Ironically, this is where we get a lot of myths and conspiracies about the Nazis, like flying saucers and secret stealth bombers 
dinosaurs and ancient aliens, if you can believe it. A lot of the people we captured during this operation worked really hard to oversell their work so they could avoid going on trial at all costs. Von Braun actually ended up being one of the notable success stories from Operation Paperclip. Now, with the war over, the Huntsville Arsenal was actually in the process of being shut down and sold off until at the last minute the army decided to repurpose it for rocket development. The Huntsville Arsenal merged into the Redstone Arsenal, which is still the name of the base today. Von Braun and his team were moved to the Redstone Arsenal in 1950 after spending about five years working in Texas. After a couple more years of work, Von Braun's next generation ICBM entered production, this time for the US. It was named the Redstone after the base where it had been designed. This line of V2 derived rockets was designed to carry nukes, iterating on Von Braun's experience developing weapons for the Nazis. But with some modification, it would also go on to launch the first American satellite and the first American astronaut into space. I'm sure this was very satisfying for Von Braun, who had been trying to use his rockets for exploration the entire time. He even went on to strap eight of these rockets together, which created the first stage of the beautiful abomination that is the Saturn I. That rocket went through several variations, it would launch satellites and crew, and even the joint US-Soviet Apollo-Soyuz mission. It went through enough changes that the next rocket they built in the Saturn line was called the Saturn V. This rocket probably needs no introduction for my audience. It was Von Braun's magnum opus, the rocket that finally carried humans to the moon. After a very successful career, Von Braun left Huntsville in 1972 to work in Washington, D.C., but he didn't like working in government and he quickly retired to a smaller company in Maryland. He only lived for another five years, dying of cancer at the age of 65. And while his work was incredibly impactful for the peaceful exploration of space, you do have to ask, was all of the harm he caused worth it? for the rockets he developed. Even without Von Braun, Huntsville continued to flourish as the rocket city. And today it is still home to branches from some of the biggest names in aerospace. You can't go anywhere without driving past the offices of somebody who's tied up in space or defense. Stores and restaurants are littered with space-themed art or memorabilia. The local minor league baseball team is called the Rocket City Trash Pandas, and their logo is literally a raccoon flying a rocket-powered trash can. And the drive out of town to the west is absolutely dominated by the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, which has not one but two Saturn Vs on display. To this day, the Redstone Arsenal is still an important proving ground for rockets. It houses NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, which is doing all sorts of tests in preparation for Artemis, including the rupture test of the first stage of the SLS. And it was also the site of ULA's recent Centaur upper stage explosion, though that one was not intentional. If you want to work in aerospace, whether it's defense, commercial, or space exploration, there's still a decent chance you're gonna end up in Huntsville, Alabama, so be sure to dress for the heat. Seriously, yesterday it was 98 degrees during a thunderstorm. What is this place?